Um, okay, so I'm going to tell you about coherent elastic neutrino nucleus scattering. Um, so here's an outline. I'll first tell you uh, what this is. Um, I'll tell you some physics motivations. We already heard uh, some about that from uh, Manfred on the first day of this, this talk, uh, first day of this conference. Um, I'll, I'll talk about how to measure it um, and uh, what kind of neutrino sources you would want. I'm going to emphasize, even though this is a review talk, I'm going to emphasize the recent measurement at the SNS by the coherent collaboration and, and tell you about the first measurement in the cesium iodide detector that we have uh, and then tell you about status and prospects. So just starting with coherent elastic neutrino nucleus scattering, which I pronounce sevens, so I'll make a comment on that in a second. This is where you have a neutrino that interacts with the nucleus as a whole by exchange of a Z. Um, and the coherent condition is when you have all the nucleon wave functions in the target nucleus basically in phase with each other, um, which happens uh, with high probability at low momentum transfer. And so you can take the total cross-section as uh, the number of constituents squared times the cross-section of a single constituent. Um, and this coherence holds for medium-sized nuclei for neutrino energies up to about 50 MeV. Just want to point out here, since I often have confusion, actually maybe more often with high energy physics audiences, I am not talking here about coherent pion production, which is a strong process um, and an inelastic process uh, where you have a, a pion actually produced. I'm talking about the elastic process where you have only a, um, a nucleus, a nuclear recoil coming out. And let me make a comment here on the nomenclature. If you look in the literature, there are many different acronyms for this process, CNS, CNNNS, CENNS. Um, I strongly favor having the E there for elastic to avoid confusion with the inelastic uh, pion production processes. Um, I'm told I've been, I've been uh, chastised by nuclear physicists for having NN, um, because that means nucleon, nucleon to many people. Um, you can put the new in there. I, I'm fine with that, um, but it's kind of annoying to have the internal Greek letters. And so I, I'm going to use sevens, where uh, you pronounce it sevens, and please uh, spread this meme. Um, this process was first proposed 43 years ago by Dan Friedman, uh, and he called it an act of hubris because of the grave experimental difficulties in actually detecting a nuclear recoil from a sevens interaction. The cross-section in the standard model is cleanly predicted. Um, here, here it is. It's a basic weak interaction um, where GV and GA are our, our favorite standard model weak parameters. The dominant contribution here is the vector one for, for nearly all nuclei that you want to talk about. Um, here, it's, you've got, uh, it depends on the Z and the N. Um, there's a, an axial contribution, which is small for most nuclei. If you have a spin zero nucleus, it's, it's basically not there at all. Um, it's because most nuclei have many fewer um, unpaired nuclei than they have uh, nucleons than they have actual nucleons. Um, in, this, in this expression for the cross section, there's this form factor here, nuclear form factor, which um, there are various models around for. Um, the uncertainty on the rate you get from the choice of model for the form factor is about 5%. Um, what this actually does is at large momentum transfer, it suppresses the cross-section. So here's an example for um, successively um, heavier nuclei. You get more suppression for the, uh, the larger target nuclei. Now, if you take the expression and you work out the uh, differential um, cross-section in, in the approximation where the uh, recoil energy is much smaller than the neutrino energy, which is a very good approximation, um, and neglecting all the axial terms, this is what the expression looks like. Um, it's proportional to the square of the weak nuclear charge, which looks like this. Now, because the weak mixing angle happens to be about 0.25, this uh, here is approximately 1, and this term, this coefficient of the number of protons, turns out to be rather small. And so this weak charge is very close to the number of neutrons in the nucleus. And so this cross-section is proportional to the square of the number of neutrons in the nucleus to a, a pretty good approximation. And here's a, a plot here. This is the... Um, the cross-section uh, averaged over a pion decay at rest flux um, as a function of neutron number here. If the form factor were 1, you would get this black line here. If you take into account the form factor um, with a 5% uncertainty being the width of the line, you would get this green line here. And these are various targets, which are, we're actually measuring and coherent, as I'll, I'll tell you about in a bit. And so you can see that there's a suppression here with respect to um, perfect coherence um, due to the form factor. But it's a well-understood one. And the cross-section, by neutrino standards, is humongous. It's a huge cross-section. These are cross-sections as a function of neutrino energy. 
Here, this is the good old inverse beta decay, which has been used for neutrino experiments since the original detection of the neutrino. This is, by, by neutrino standards, also a pretty large cross-section of, of antineutrinos on protons. This is scattering on electrons um, per electron in a, a, a per nucleus in a relatively large nucleus. Um, so these are the, the typical kind of cross-sections. This would be a, a typical charge current cross-section. This is on iodine. If you take cesium and iodine here, the sevens cross-section is orders of magnitude bigger. So it's a, a humongous cross-section. The nucleus looks like an enormous blob to the neutrino compared to the other, um, the other typical interactions. Now, it hasn't been measured due to these grave experimental difficulties that Dan Friedman pointed out. Now, why? The answer is that even though the cross-section is large, it is very hard to observe these very tiny recoil energies. It's like hitting a bowling ball with a ping pong ball. It's pretty easy to do that, but it's hard to get that bowling ball moving very fast. And this is an example here. This is uh, for germanium for a 30 MeV neutrino incident. This is the spectrum of recoil energies that you would expect. Um, these are KeV energies. These are uh, tens of KeV energies here. And the maximum recoil energy is 2 E nu squared over M. Um, and this is only about 25 keV for germanium, and you compare that to a typical neutrino experiment like super K, which would have a threshold of, say, 4 MeV. These are little tiny, tiny blips that are very difficult to observe. And so that's why it hasn't been observed until very recently. And the only experimental signature you have is this little tiny recoil, this little energy deposited um, in whatever the target material is, um, and it can be uh, converted to light or phonons or whatever, something that um, you can actually uh, record. And the thing that has changed in the past few decades is that there's actually now a whole range of technology uh, sensitive to these very tiny recoils um, exactly in this energy range of a few to a few tens of keV, um, basically designed to look for the exact same kind of little tiny recoils as has been employed for searching for WIMPs, for, for dark matter WIMPs. So there's a whole range of technology now available for this. Okay, so that's, that's the first item. So why should we bother trying to measure this? So let me just mention briefly some physics motivations. This is a whole talk in itself, and we heard some of it from Manfred already. I'm just going to zoom in on a couple of them. So there's many of these things. One of, the, one of them is it's actually a, a background or a signal, depending on your point of view, in a direct dark matter detection experiment. It is a cleanly calculable cross-section in the standard model. Um, it's because, in fact, the uh, nuclear, um, the nature of the nucleus comes in in the form factor, which is uh, well understood at the 5% level, and that means that you can probe beyond the standard model physics actually quite well, and I'll, I'll zoom in a little bit on that. There's other reasons, too. It's a new tool for sterile neutrino interactions, uh, ster or sterile neutrino oscillations, uh, since it doesn't care about the flavor. You can look for astrophysical signals. Um, uh, it's relevant for supernovae. Um, uh, you can also do nuclear physics at good enough pre precision, and there's even possibly applications thanks to the large uh, cross-section. So let me just pull out a couple of these and say a bit more. This is the plot that's already been shown several times at this conference. This is the, uh, what, what some people call the neutrino floor, but I kind of like to think of it as an opportunity for signal in dark matter experiments, um, where in this, um, as a function of WIMP mass, this is where you would start to run into issues. Um, and so here, solar neutrinos uh, would make a signal uh, in this um, regime, supernova and atmospheric neutrinos. And you would want to measure this process first to understand the nature of the background or the signal and the detector response in the detectors. You can use it actually kind of as a detector calibration for small recoils. Okay, here's another example. This is non-standard interactions of neutrinos. If you um, imagine there is some new interaction that is specific to neutrinos and quarks and write it down in an effective Lagrangian here. Um, there, this is um, traditionally now in the literature parameterized by these epsilon parameters, where if you have an epsilon uh, term in your Lagrangian, that parameterizes a, um, a new interaction of approximately, if epsilon is one, it's approximately the scale of the standard model interaction. And many of these are actually not well constrained by any, um, any other um, experiment. And so here's an example. In fact, if you take two of them, these are the EE, epsilon EE, um, on D and on U quarks. This, this um, green circle is the um, allowed region from um, the CHARM experiment, which was already decades ago. Um, and these uh, bars here, these um, bands, 
are the kind of constraint you could make from just a first generation experiment. And or um, I'll, I'll show you actually some act actual results we have from the coherent experiment that constrain these interactions. And if you combine different experiments, you get um, you, if you combine different targets with different values of n, you get a better constraints. And so for best sensitivity, you want to have multiple targets with multiple values of n. Okay, so now let me talk about how you go about measuring sevens. So you need a neutrino source and you need a detector. And so let me talk about the source. So what do you want in your source? Obviously, you want lots of neutrinos. That's always true. You want to have a spectrum of neutrinos that is well understood. You would like to have multiple flavors if you can. Um, that gives you a broader physics sensitivity. You would like actually a source that is pulsed rather than uh, steady state, because that allows you to reject background from cosmogenics or radioactivity and so on. Um, that's a, a great benefit to have a pulse source. And you'd like practical things. You'd like to be able to get close and have um, access and so on. So let me um, make a couple of points about the energy scale of the neutrinos you want to do the experiment with. So both the cross-section and the maximum recoil energy increase with neutrino energy. And so the plot on the left here is the maximum recoil energy, which is e squared goes as e squared over the mass of the nucleus, uh, as a function of neutrino energy. This is for an example of argon. It goes here as the square. Um, and so the higher the neutrino energy, the higher, um, the higher the maximum recoil energy you have. On the left here, I'm, I have the example here. This is for the same flux of neutrinos. This is the expected recoil spectrum. And so here in the green, this is for monochromatic 3 MeV neutrinos. So that's a typical energy you would get from a reactor, uh, 3 MeV or so. And you see the recoil spectrum here um, ends less than 1 keV. Okay? So these are low, very, very low energy recoils. Now, if you take 30 MeV neutrinos at the same flux, you actually get a higher cross-section. You get a higher interaction rate because the cross-section is higher. It's approximately the square of the neutrino energy. So you get more recoils. And furthermore, you get more of them kicked to high energy. You get a higher maximum recoil energy as well with higher energy neutrinos, such as from pion decay at rest. Now, you don't want to go overboard because um, you don't want to lose coherence. If you have energies of your neutrinos that are too high, you will start to scatter off nucleons instead of entire nuclei. Um, and so you want to satisfy the coherence condition, which is that the momentum transfer should be something like uh, 1 over r. And that corresponds to neutrino energies of about 50 MeV for a medium-sized nucleus. And so around a few tens of MeV is actually a great place to be. So now let me list various sources of neutrinos you could use for Sevens experiments. Um, these are wild neutrinos, natural sources. Um, you get supernova burst neutrinos, one of my favorite things, and that Christina talked about. This would actually be great, but of course you have to wait for the supernova to happen. Um, supernova relic neutrinos, um, which are diffuse background supernova neutrinos. These would also be great, but there's very few of them around. There's atmospheric neutrinos. These are um, mostly kind of high energy, but there'll be some component at low energy. Solar neutrinos, uh, geoneutrinos, these are eventually going to be observable in dark matter experiments, but their flux is relatively low. Now, these are the tame neutrino sources. These are artificial sources of neutrinos. We have reactors, which pump out neutrinos like crazy, um, and they're low energy, less than typically several MeV. There's neutrinos from decay at rest, which I'm going to tell you more about, which go up to 50 MeV. Um, there's also radioactive sources. These tend to be rather low energy, so the recoils are really super, super low energy. Um, you can have beam-induced radioactive sources, which actually would be quite nice, but these don't exist quite yet. And same thing for uh, low energy beta beams that Christina talked about. These also don't exist, although they're potentially nice kinds of sources for this, uh, for Seven's experiments. So I'm going to focus on, the, on the, the top two, the reactors and the stopped pions. Now, if you're going to do a sevens experiment with these, so these are kind of the, the, um, the pros and the cons and the properties. Reactors have four orders of magnitude more flux, more uh, than um, pion decay at rest sources, typically. Um, so they have a, a huge flux. That's a definitely a pro of using reactors. They're only new bar flavor, uh, whereas uh, stopped pions have three flavors. Um, the energies here are lower, as I mentioned before. Um, and so the pros here for reactors really humongous flux, but the cons are that the cross sections lower, they require a much lower threshold, and they're steady state. The benefits of a stop pion source are that cross sections higher, higher energy recoils, 
the, the beam may be pulsed, which is fantastic um, for background rejection, and you get multiple flavors. Um, the cons are the flux is lower, and there's also potentially um, in time uh, neutron background, although it turns out that's not a big deal, as uh, I'll show you. Now, there are still, there are lots, in spite of the, um, the uh, disadvantages of reactor sources, the high flux is very attractive, and there are multiple proposals for doing sevens experiments at reactors. Here's a list of them. Um, we heard about CONUS from Manfred uh, a few days ago, germanium detector. Um, there's also other kinds of, um, it's, it's usually novel technology since it's very difficult to get the threshold down low enough to uh, see the recoils from a reactor. But there's a bolometer experiment called Ricochet. Connie uses silicon CCDs. This is a dual phase liquid argon um, experiment in Russia. Um, there's uh, novel ideas for cryogenic um, calorimeter arrays and then um, detectors like uh, CDMS. So there's uh, you know, lots, of, lots of things going on uh, trying to observe these. But what I'm going to talk about now is coherent, which uses stopped pion neutrinos, or pion decay at rest neutrinos. And this, these are neutrinos where the pion decays at rest. You get a two-body nu mu decay um, that gives you a 30 MeV monochromatic nu mu. When the mu1 decays, you, it's a three-body decay, but with a well-understood spectrum from weak physics, which gives you a range of energies up to a maximum of 50 MeV with known flavors. And this is very well understood. If you have this going on and, and you know your pions are decaying at rest, you know what you're, um, what you're looking at. Um, here is a figure of merit plot for different pion decay at rest sources. Some of them are past, some of them are present, some of them are future. Um, and so the figure of merit here is on this axis. Uh, this is the power, and you, this is approximately proportional to the neutrino flux, so you want this to be as big as you can possibly make it. So you want to be out on this side of the axis. This is a background re rejection factor figure of merit. This tells you how, this is related to how pulsed your sources are, how tightly in time your neutrinos are bunched. And um, so you get this from the duty cycle, and you want this to be high. You want to have very tightly pulsed neutrinos. You want them all coming when you know they're coming, so you can reject background outside of that window. And if I plot the various sources on here, this is the spallation neutron source that we're using. This is J Park here, which is actually also pretty good. This one has uh, maybe slightly better characteristics, and it's also actually a somewhat cleaner um, from the point of view of the spectrum. And then there's future ideas um, or future sources. ESS has good power, probably less good timing, and uh, Daedalus is an idea that's been out there for a while. But I'm going to zoom in on now on the SNS, spallation neutron source at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. This has, um, this is a facility not built for neutrinos at all. It is a complete accident that it is a fabulous neutrino source. Uh, it has a proton beam energy of about 1 GeV and power of about a megawatt. Um, can go up to 1.4, uh, often runs at 1.2 megawatts. It has a very nice tight time structure of the protons on the target. It's got a mercury target, so the protons smash into this mercury target. It's this impressive, massive thing. It is so dense and large that essentially every single pion that is produced will come to a screeching halt and decay at rest, which is actually a, a great benefit for understanding a neutrino source. And the neutrinos are free, and that's, that's also a, an enormous benefit. This is what the time structure looks like of the neutrinos that you get from the SNS. It's pulsed at 60 hertz with about a uh, several hundred nanosecond um, width of the protons, which uh, the muons, the, the, um, the pions that produce new mu's, will give you prompt new mu in time with the proton pulse, which is a very tight peak here um, with new mu flavor. And then these, this is from the decay of the muon um, on the 2.2 microsecond decay time scale. And this gives you a background rejection factor of a few times 10 to the minus 4. It's actually a, a, a very, very nice, clean source. And it's furthermore very clean. And this is, a, um, this is from our Giant 4 simulation of the uh, neutrino flux. Um, in just showing you the shape of it, this is a log scale. This is the, um, the decay at rest component over here. There is some kind of grass out here at higher energy. These are the, some of this is the decay in flight stuff that Christina was talking about. Uh, but it, it is, it's suppressed by several orders of magnitude, which is actually, a, you know, I guess if you want decay in flight, that's not good. But if you want a clean, well understood source, it is extremely good. Um, and the flux is actually, um, it's, it's uh, 4.3 times 10 to the fifth neutrinos per square centimeter per second at 20 meters away. Okay, let me talk about backgrounds, which are potentially scary. Um, 
given that it's a stellation neutron source and neutrons are produced and flying around, um, you are certainly subject in your detector to the usual issues of cosmogenics, um, ambient and intrinsic radioactivity in your detector, whatever kind of noise your detector has. Neutrons are especially not your friends because they will come in and they will smack into nuclei and make little recoils just as a neutrino would. Um, and also, these, this of course is a classic background for dark matter detectors as well. But the benefit of having a pulse source is that any of these steady state backgrounds can be measured off your beam window and then subtracted. So you only care about the physical fluctuations of them. You don't care about, you don't have any systematic uncertainties on those um, off beam pulse backgrounds. However, the backgrounds that are in time with the beam are something that you have to worry about and characterize carefully. And there's one that is actually of particular interest, and this is what we call NINS, which stands for Neutrino Induced Neutrons. It's a kind of a friendly fire background. This, these are um, neutrons that you get when the neutrino comes in and actually interacts by either charge or neutral current interaction and kicks out a neutron from the nucleus. And then that neutron, and that, that is actually interesting as a signal in itself, for example, for the halo supernova detector. But if you're trying to do a sevens experiment, it's annoying because the neutron will come into your detector and can kick something. And of course, you can't shield this kind of neutron because your shield is the source of them. Um, and so this is actually potentially a non-negligible background. And to minimize this kind of thing, you need to have careful shielding design. This is an example. Actually, the cross-section is not so small. This is, I think, from Christina's uh, calculation of the cross-section for NIN production in lead here compared with the sevens cross-section in germanium. And it's still smaller, but it's, it's potentially not negligible if you have a lot of lead next to your detector. And so this is something we have to um, worry about. Um, and I can mention that it's, it's an interesting interaction in itself for nuclear physics and for supernova detection. OK, so now let me talk about the coherent experiment. So this is a collaboration of about 80 people um, in 19 institutions and, and four countries. Uh, we have four detectors in um, trying to measure sevens in the, um, at the SNS. And so we have cesium iodide scintillating crystal, where the mechanism for seeing the recoil energy is you see a little flash of light. Uh, we have germanium, where the mechanism is, is uh, ionization. This is uh, like Majorana detectors. There's uh, liquid argon. Again, a little flash of, uh, you, get, you see the scintillation in single phase. It's a flash of light. There's uh, um, sodium iodide crystals. Again, it's a scintillating crystal uh, flash of light. Um, the masses we have here, it's 14 and a half kilograms of cesium iodide crystal. Uh, we have about 10 kilograms of germanium in hand, uh, liquid argon, 22 kilograms, and uh, sodium iodide. We actually have a huge amount of it, um, and 185 kilograms are deployed, but with currently not a low enough threshold to C7s. And we have a distance from the, um, the SNS source of ranging from uh, 20 to almost 30 uh, meters, so actually very, very close distance, and with recoil thresholds that are sensitive to 7s. Um, here's the sighting for the deployment. So this is where the proton beam comes in. Um, this is the uh, mercury target right here. And then there's a bunch of beam lines that shuttle the neutrons out for various other neutron-related uh, experiments that are un unrelated to us. We just sit in the isotropic glow of the neutrinos in the basement. Um, there's, it turns out there's fortuitously a very nice basement hallway which runs parallel to the proton beam that is separated from all of this stuff, the beam line and the target, from about, with about 20 meters of concrete. And that's also a very good luck location that we actually found this hallway. We call it Neutrino Alley. That's a view looking down the hallway there. Um, and we have um, detectors deployed here. This is where the detectors are. Some of them are deployed, some of them are not. Um, I'll, I'll show you status in a bit. Um, but we have them um, arrayed out around here, um, just sitting, waiting for the neutrinos, which are coming isotropically from the, from the target. And we don't have any, you know, we, um, we're completely parasitic. The neutrons are produced for neutron experiments, and we just get the neutrinos when they're, whenever they're coming. This is the expected recoil energy distribution for the targets that we have. Um, this is all sanitized. There's no detector efficiencies or anything here. Um, you can see the kinematics in action here. The um, heaviest target here has, uh, um, these, are, these are scaled by the appropriate masses, but the heaviest target actually has higher cross-section, but you get less kick to high energy than the lightest target. This here is for sodium iodide. This is the uh, lightest of the targets, which uh, will give the highest energy recoils. 
Okay, let me now talk about the first measurement with cesium iodide. This was a detector um, built at Chicago in um, a 14 and a half kilogram um, cesium iodide uh, doped with sodium uh, crystal. And uh, this is a schematic of the, of the shielding, the, uh, which was actually redesigned in order to take into account the NINs. Um, so there's uh, 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 layers. Here's, these are the different layers of the shielding here. There's uh, two different layers of, of lead, a muon veto, and then water on the outside. This is a handheld detector. It's a neutrino detector, actually um, the smallest one that has actually seen neutrinos in the world, um, which you, know, you actually do want it to be bigger, but for a moment that will be true. Um, and so this is what it looks like here in Neutrino Alley. Here's the data taking. Uh, we've got neutron. Uh, we started taking neutron background data actually uh, a long time ago in, in 2013. Uh, the cesium iodide data taking started in, su in summer 2015. And we now have um, more than 10 to the 23 protons on target delivered, which is actually quite a large number compared to, for example, long baseline uh, neutrino experiments. Um, here is the cesium iodide. Um, I'll, I'll show you the results now. This is actually a test crystal, which was characterized at the University of Chicago. Um, the trick for the cesium iodide is that it's, it's sodium doped, which gives you a suppression of afterglow, which is what really enables this experiment to run on the surface. You don't have constantly uh, photons flying in from uh, previous cosmic cosmic um, cosmogenics from cosmic muons. And so here you can see there's a, a nice, this is time after the interaction. You get a nice suppression of the afterglow. It's a rugged and stable detector. It runs at room temperature. It has low intrinsic background. So it's, it's a, a really, um, really nice detector. These are the first measurements. So on the right here is the beam on data. This is the beam off data for, uh, for um, this is, uh, um, where the residuals are, so the anti-coincidence data for a, a window off the beam is subtracted, and you can clearly see the signal. The colors here represent the different flavor contributions from the prediction. Um, this is here the charge distribution. This is photoelectrons. It's about one photoelectron per keV. This is the, uh, the time distribution, so the same data plotted in time. You can see there's a little, this yellow part is the estimate of the prompt beam neutrons, which is something that we worried a lot about at first that would be a big contribution, but it turns out that it's actually quite small. It's at the uh, 3 or 4 percent level. Um, this was published in Science uh, last summer and actually uh, made the cover um, several weeks ago. This is a result from uh, uh, 2D energy and time fit here. This is the um, the, the curve here corresponds to the, this is the likely, so it's a two-dimensional likelihood fit that takes into account both the time and the energy distribution. The best fit value here is 134 events in the time period, plus or minus 22. So this is uh, uncertainty here is primarily statistical uncertainty. The best fit is there. This band here, uh, this line here corresponds to our prediction from the standard model. Um, which is 173 events, and the width of this band here is the uncertainty on the prediction. And no sevens is rejected here. Um, it's, this is a very much away from zero. It's rejected at 6.7 sigma. It's highly statistically significant, and it is consistent with the standard model prediction within one sigma. Um, this is the list of the uncertainties and the, um, the uh, um, Budget here, the dominant uncertainty actually comes from the quenching factor. Our total uncertainty on the signal prediction is 28%. Um, these uncertainties are primarily statistical. You can set constraints on um, non-standard interactions. This is the parameter space I showed you before. From this first data set, you get this, uh, in, out, this region, which is allowed, and everything outside is, is, uh, is, is um, disfavored at 90%. And, um, I just want to point out one thing, that this is the first measurement of a neutral current neutrino hadron interaction that has spectral information. In fact, these are a couple of interpretations, both in particle physics and nuclear physics, where there's a first interpretation. This is from uh, Carlo Giunti and collaborators of the, um, of the, uh, uh, the, the uh, neutron radius. And so there'll be more coming soon. So what's next? Um, these are the deployments in Neutrino Alley. We, go, we must hurry up. We are much late. Okay, I've got just a couple slides. These are the deployments in Neutrino Alley. Um, these are the uh, seven detectors and the other detectors measuring charge current interactions. This, the status of the future is that cesium iodide will continue running uh, for some time. There's no specific decommissioning date. 
the 185 kilograms of, of sodium iodide is, is now installed and running. The single phase detector is now running, and the first germanium detectors will be installed late this year. These are possible future upgrades. Whoops, basically um, expansion of all these, and we actually have many other ideas for uh, future targets that you can ask me about. Um, and um, here's the summary. Sevens has a large cross-section but tiny recoils. Cross-section goes as the square of the number of neutrons. Um, it's accessible with these low threshold detectors, and the extra oomph of the energy of the neutrinos from the stop pion source uh, gives you a little extra um, event rate. Um, there are many motivations. First measurement with coherent. Um, we have gone after the low-hanging fruit, which is bounds on NSI, but there's many more interpretations and multiple targets and upgrades coming on, and there's other experiments which will soon join the fun. Many ideas at reactors ongoing. So that's all. I'll stop there. Thank you.